Yohai Bakler wrote one of the most important pieces of social science research in my mind the last 20 years, helping to understand, I think it should be canon, and to help understand uh, American politics and American political media. His most recent article is about suppressing the vote, the real reason the GOP suppresses the vote. The book is Network Propaganda. The guest is Yohai Bankler, professor at Harvard Law School. Sir, thank you so much for being with us. Happy to be with you. First, let's talk about Network Propaganda. It is a book that's in circulation. People can get it. You should explain how people can get it because you've tried to make access to the book easy. You're not doing this to make a mint. You're doing this to help inform democracy. But I think you walking us through that for people who aren't familiar would be an excellent way to start. So uh, first of all, if you do want to get the book, it's available uh, freely online, open access from Oxford University Press. So if you just search... Network propaganda, open access, you should be able to get it. If you can't, you need to poke around Oxford University Press uh, uh, site for the book and you can get it and you can read it in PDF or in online uh, uh, freely. You can also buy it through the usual channels, but you don't have to. That's uh, always been a commitment of mine. Everything that I've published in the last 20 years is open access. So so uh, this is uh, uh, not unusual except for academic presses. The premise of network propaganda was a set of research where you looked at lots and lots of data points to try to find what I use is not the correct term, but it looked to me like sort of synaptic connections of a hive brain. Uh, How do you describe the research that you all did to help understand the connections and sort of the basic thesis or even introductory, introductory hypothesis of the work? So we built a database that allows us to read essentially automatically millions of stories to look at how they link at each other to analyze their text to analyze how they are tweeted to analyze how they're shared on public facebook pages and together in network propaganda we looked at four million online stories that uh, began in April of 2015 at the very beginning of the presidential election in 2016 and ended on January of uh, 2018 at the one year anniversary of the Trump administration. And what we did was we performed some network analysis to see how news sites link to each other, essentially when you're producing a story and you're linking to someone else, you're saying, that's my authority. It's the New York Times, I'm linking to the New York Times. The Fox News, the Breitbart, to the Gateway Pundit, to Daily Cost, that's my source. So that gives us an image, how sites link to each other, how often, who is linked to most, and by whom. Gives us a measure of the authority of sites among media producers. But we also look at how sites are tweeted together. So if the same Twitter user Uh, tweets the New York Times and the Washington Post on the same day or Daily Kos and the Guardian on the same day, in our networks, that means those sites are close to each other. If it's Breitbart and Fox News or the Daily Caller, then those are closer. And what we do, this allows us essentially to produce networks looking at millions of stories, tens of millions of tweets uh, uh, and Facebook shares Uh, that tell us what is the architecture of the media ecosystem. And one of, not one of, the clearest result, the cleanest result that was repeated over no matter how we slice the data, is that we have a highly asymmetric media ecosystem. On the right, you have an insular system where sites link only to each other, users mostly tweet just from that framework. Facebook users similarly tweet. So you have an insular system that just circulates itself on the right. It's anchored during the primaries. It was anchored on Breitbart before Fox jumped on the Trump bandwagon. But starting in May, June of, of 2016 and on to the end of the period, Fox is at the center with it Breitbart. What we see when we look at 2020, long after the book, in the current research, New York Post joins Fox News as a major site there. Uh, But that's very insular. But there's no parallel on the left. 
what you see, we don't call it the left, rather the rest, because it really includes everything from the Wall Street Journal and Forbes on the center right to Daily Kos and Mother Jones on the left. This entire rest of the media ecosystem is tightly connected. There's no parallel on the left to the right, but rather you have a single rest of the media ecosystem with its peak attention and authority on the mainstream professional press, on the New York Times, on the Washington Post, on CNN, uh, and what we saw in the 2020 election, also more of, an, uh, of, of, of a rise of the AP, ABC, CBS, NBC, so more, even more centrist outlets uh, join those, those core outlets. But the basic structure remains the same when we repeat the same analysis for 2019 and 2020. So we have a very stable media ecosystem with an insular right wing that's focused and heavily focused on relatively extreme sites like the Gateway Pundit and True Pundit quite close to Fox News and Breitbart. And we have a rest of the media ecosystem that is um, uh, integrated around the mainstream professional press. So when we look at this map the, that you've done, how, how do you describe, you, you call it a network analysis. What should I call this map? It looks to me like a mind map or a power map. Your term is? It's a network map. So when you look at the network map, and we should even get an image of it and put it up, uh, when you you see this asymmetry, you see this clustering, uh, and I think you even use blue and red, you use this clustering uh, that's that's very tightly connected. And and within the, what do you use, conservative media, is that the phrasing you use to describe right wing. the right-wing media? And, and that has certain repercussions, right? It means that uh, it impacts the behavior of what those media outlets can do if they want to retain their audience. So this is uh, one of the things as we were trying to understand what happened, one of the things that's very clear is that there's a very strong and different market dynamic on the right versus the rest. And that actually doesn't start with online media. That starts much earlier with uh, Limbaugh and, and Christian radio, which and, and Christian broadcast, which we can come back to if we're interested later. But um, the basic dynamic on the right, what Limbaugh found as such a brilliant business model in the late 80s, is that in a very dispersed media ecosystem, where you can't anymore just, uh, uh, like there are three networks or one newspaper town, you can't uh, uh, program just to the middle, you have to find a segment. And what uh, Limbaugh discovered, or really it's Christian Broadcasting before him. Father Tom Fox, Coughlin is what I'm guessing, your, your early stages of what you're thinking about, or maybe after Father Tom Coughlin, you're thinking about what? Uh, so no, 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 no. Coughlin, uh, Coughlin is the 1930s. That's a, that's a, that's, that period ends with World War II. Uh, so you mean really, like Jim it's Baker? A precursor. Uh, it's, it starts with Pat Robertson, yeah. who really starts putting news on uh, uh, on on uh, uh, 700 Club in 1980, uh, Christian Broadcast Network by 86 is the third most watched cable network uh, after CNN and ESPN. Uh, that's the initial economic proving ground, but it's really Limbaugh on AM radio who takes off and makes it big business. And then Roger Ailes moves from from producing Limbaugh's TV. Uh, uh, effort to uh, Fox and Fox rolls out in 96 and does it. But the basic idea is that this is a market segment that has identified a dedicated audience that wants to be fed identity confirming narratives. They want to be reinforced in their identity. They want to be able to be told that there's somebody they can hate. They want to be able to be told that they not don't need to, in fact, shouldn't trust mainstream media, they shouldn't trust science, they're quite alienated from the elite mainstream, and this business model is essentially to give the audience what it wants. As a, fun as a practical matter, what that means is that if an outlet tries to come in and slice off a piece of that market to be somewhat more reality-based, uh, it's ignored. 
and that puts pressure on right-wing politicians, etc. We never saw the same thing emerge on the left. When MSNBC and Air America tried to move in that direction uh, in 2006, uh, the audience turned out to be too spread out. There were different market segments. The coalition, in some sense, was too diverse. The competition with already existing sources that provided something that's more like the Wall Street Journal, that is to say factual reporting plus editorial content that was uh, consistent with identity, was already sufficiently robust. NPR was in that mode to some extent, the New York Times was. So there was a lot less um, uh, latent demand for the kind of mirror image of Hannity and Limbaugh on the left, and it never coalesced into a similar uh, uh, independent press. And because it was woven with the more traditional professional media, outlets that were partisan nonetheless retained those models. So we had these two completely different media ecosystem dynamics. You had the propaganda feedback loop on the right that where outlets police each other for deviation from identity confirmation. And you have what we call a, a reality check dynamic in the rest of the media ecosystem where media outlets compete to some extent on giving identity confirmation, but they're limited by the fact that they police each other for factual content as well. And that creates a completely different dynamic also in the two political uh, uh, cultures. So the example, an example I remember, is an example you used about Fox News, that Fox News had dropped out of the top five in terms of the network power that they were having online, not speaking to their cable ratings, I think, but just speaking to their network power online. And what got them back into the top five, as I recall, was when they stopped, when they started talking about Bill Clinton and pedophilia. Do I have that story? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, this was, this was really remarkable. Uh, uh, what happened is that during the primaries, uh, the, um, Trump supporting media, most powerfully uh, uh, Steve Bannon's Breitbart when he was still running it, um, mounted a sustained attack on Fox News. And you're right, this is not about cable ratings, this is about online, but it's very clear from our network measures that Fox lost audience and particularly lost audience from the most active online users who were very focused on Trump and on that extreme right-wing media. They came back after Trump clearly became, uh, and, and you saw attacks on Murdoch, you saw attacks on Fox from the right, very aggressively. Um, what happened in May is they turned around and they decided to join the game. Uh, and their flagship product, what ended up being uh, uh, their most Facebook shared story throughout the entire period, was really this, this original story claiming that Bill Clinton had flown with Jeffrey Epstein to Bitophilia Island on the Lolita Express, as it were, um, 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 20 some times. And this shows up on uh, uh, online on Fox, it then shows up on the TV, on the, new, on the straight news, but very heavily replicated in the opinion pieces. And this becomes the primary source of accreditation for all the Clinton pedophilia stories that follow it, all the way up to and including what ends up being Pizzagate and the origins of, of uh, QAnon. So you can trace all of those back to that strategic move to come back into the fold by circulating this, this Clinton pedophilia story. We look at that and we look at that behavior. So what rewards the right wing media producer who is appealing to that audience? And I want in a moment to talk about what about that movement made that possible. You already hinted at it or even suggested a piece of it. But I want to get back to that. But in terms of what is at stake, why it matters is that it. But your research shows, I think we kind of understand this a little bit already, but you can put a picture to it and put data to it and prove our fear that if you are Fox News and you try to counter what the Republican president is doing, 
if you try to counter what Breitbart is doing or Drudge Report is doing or some other right-wing news outlet is doing, you will not impact the fears. You won't impact the thoughts of that audience as much as that audience will depart you. That's certainly what we saw during the primaries in 2016, and there we were able to actually show it and measure it. That is the dynamic. That is the dynamic. And and in truth, if you look at what happened to some of the Never Trump outlets uh, that were online outlets and, and were, were less willing to go in that direction, uh, they died in the, in, the, in the years. This is so... As you look at uh, uh, as you look even at the National Review, which which shrunk, it starts to move to the right, and by this time we see it closer uh, to the right. By the time of the 2020 election, uh, the alternative is to close shop. That's very clear in the in the data. It's really important to recognize. Coming back just quickly to your point about the different dynamic between the two media ecosystems, at almost the same time that Fox was pushing the Epstein story, the the Clinton pedophilia story. There was a story that came on the left of Donald Trump raping a 13 year old at an Epstein party. That within days was debunked, not on the right, but by uh, the Guardian, Jezebel, the Daily Beast. So it was that that story died not because there weren't people on the left who wanted to hear the worst and believe the worst of Trump, but because that entire media ecosystem internally was able to check it. So, so we really do see the dynamic very differently, and there's no real room in the market structure on the right for a reality-anchored, more moderate outlet. Uh, in the way that there is um, um, outside of it. And there's a risk, of course, that this, and and how to get this understanding of the current political discourse, of the current media landscape, of the current network propaganda, to have that understood by 70% of the people, 80%, 90% of the people, itself seems like hard, right, to puncture this bubble, to enter that echo chamber, disrupt that echo chamber. Because what I heard you just say ends up an extraordinarily partisan conclusion, okay? Not with necessarily partisan motives or partisan biased research, but a partisan conclusion, which is what I heard you just say, is that for, you know, Lincoln Project Republicans and, and you know, Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders voting Democrats or Ralph Nader voting Green Party members uh, or Alexander Ocasio-Cortez supporting Twitter agents, uh, they are impacted significantly by facts, or at least uh, the audiences of their major media outlets, where their eyeballs go most, are impacted significantly by facts. They see some crazy thing about uh, Donald Trump, and they might hate Donald Trump and want that thing to be true, but their own media outlets will have a commitment to breaking down that falsehood, if it is falsehood, and will be rewarded with eyeballs and punished without. But what you also just said then is on the right wing, that the reward is not based on facts. The reward is based on identity, that if it rewards, if it it reinforces rather uh, one's worldview about Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton murdering people or whatever the heck it is, then that will get eyeballs. But even facts that disrupt it will be punished, not rewarded. That I want to make sure I'm giving an appropriate synopsis, you can push back on what I'm missing, but that seems to be an enormously partisan conclusion. Uh, I wish I could tell you that it's uh, uh, false as a conclusion, uh, but that is the conclusion, and, um, you know, the data is out there. Uh, We can look at it. Uh, If the facts, uh, 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 as best we can say, with the best techniques that are available to us, suggest such a partisan uh, uh, position, then that's, um, then that's where we are. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I'll say this. I'm aware that the, the results in some sense fit my preconception of how things are working just as a background news observer. And so we, we, that's precisely why we were so rigorous, used so much data, 
have looked and analyzed it in so many days to try to persuade ourselves that uh, what we see is, in fact, there in the data rather than in our preferences. I'm confident in the results. I'd say, for example, for the, the chapter on the Russians, I can't tell you how much we, how often we ran, because if it was at all plausible that the election was genuinely uh, stolen by Russians, that would be a huge thing. And we just went item by item, things that were alleged, looked at where they came and came to the conclusion that no, the Russians didn't matter. That was in some sense counter to the partisan narrative that was floating at the time. Uh, all I can do, all anyone can do, is follow the best procedures in the discipline and try to come up with the best evidence, make it available for others uh, to, to disagree with, and uh, see what happens. I'm very confident that, that what we see, I have interpretations that may be more partisan, but I think what we see in the facts is what we see in the facts. And that's very clear, very consistent across different specifications at this point now across five or six years worth of data collected. Um, and it's unambiguous. I want to pick up on something you said, at least as service to some potentially more conservative viewers and listeners. You said you looked into the uh, allegations of Russian interference. There were there was a, Russian interference attempts. That lots of people have said that. I think what I heard you say was that it didn't have as big an impact as the people decrying it fear it might have had. Explain. I want to get back to the sort of central point and even do your more recent article. But I think that's worth doing because I've got to also make sure I'm challenged challenging my own uh, presuppositions, right? If we're if we are only confirming our own biases, we will not have a fact driven democracy. So I want to go at the stuff that also it might cut against my own my own hunchery. Explain explain your findings on the Russia stuff. So uh, what we did was we uh, uh, we don't contest that no, at any point that there were efforts by the Russians uh, to do anything. What we did, however, <clears throat> was we looked at the specific allegations of when Russian interfered, what the specific things that we found, whether it was in the Mueller indictment, whether it was in the House uh, Minority Report, whether it was in the intelligence report later on, uh, and we said, okay, what happened here? Well, here's a particular Twitter account uh, that tweets about top 10 geo, uh, the tweets about voter fraud on this particular day in 2016. We then go back and say, okay, let's look at all of the stories about voter fraud in 2016 and see if the Russians impacted it. We see a spike at about the same time. So we dig into that spike and we say, what, where did the Russians intervene? What caused the spike? And then it turns out Donald Trump makes a statement in response to three opinions that strike down voter suppression efforts that depend on voter fraud. He says there's voter fraud. There's three days worth of a big wave of coverage across both center and right media. And then after three days, the Russians jump on the bandwagon. We look at it again, it happens again in November, and we look at each of these episodes and we say, when did the Russians intervene? Did they come before or after? Can they plausibly be asserted to have been the trigger of the change? So that's one class of analyses. The second is to look at the relative impact of the DNC and the, uh, and the Podesta email hacks to see how they shaped understanding. So one of the first things to recognize is that when you look at AP, uh, at, at, at um, um, uh, Gallup polling, um, Hillary Clinton was overwhelmingly associated with email before the Podesta email dump. And then we looked at all of the stories that mentioned Clinton with emails for a year and a half. And the overwhelming majority of them, all the peaks in coverage are the State Department releases a new dump. Uh, Judicial Watch gets uh, a FOIA request and 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 presents it in some form or another. Um, 
Each and every one of these examples, except for the DNC, come from the uh, uh, come from the processes related to the State Department, the private server, etc. Until eventually, the Comey announcement a week before the the election completely dominates coverage in that last week. Uh, dwarfs anything related to either the DNC or Podesta. So again, it's very hard incrementally to say the Russians caused it. And so we go through the whole the whole evidence, and and here and there we find a specific story: Podesta engaged in a satanic ritual. That looks like something that came out of the Russian hacked emails, got pushed by a Sputnik reporter moonlighting on some blog. And within eight hours, made it to Alex Jones info war, and another three hours later on Hannity. There we can say, okay, the Russians did it. But overall, that's not a persuasive enough case that they made the difference when you have all this massive propaganda happening on the right throughout the period of the election. That's the structure of the argument and the structure of the analysis. A map. And can you see it, Professor, behind me? You've yeah. seen it a million times in your life. It's it's in the book. It's defined much of your recent work. The uh, explain what we're seeing. What, if I'm looking at this and I'm just looking at blue and red, what it looks to me like is there's a smaller red cluster. Uh, the biggest red dot is Breitbart, and it looks here like the New York Times and CNN uh, and the uh, and maybe the Washington Post and the Huffington yeah. Post are liberal propaganda uh, at, with big blue dots. How? Uh, Am I interpreting that correctly or explain the ways I'm misinterpreting that? So so great, slowly. Um, First of all, the colors. The colors, there are actually five of them. There's there's red, orange, which barely exists. That's uh, center-right. Green, which is center, light blue, and blue. Essentially what we do is we look at the tweeting behavior of uh, users. And when we did it in the book, that was basically on whether they retweeted tweeted Clinton or Trump. In our current work on the 2020 election, we have a much larger data set on each user in terms of who they follow and what their political orientation is. So we give Twitter users a political orientation, and then we look at each site and we said, what's the ratio of liberals and conservatives Uh, tweeting this outcome. So if you've got a ratio of more than four to one right-wingers, you're right. If it's three to two right-wingers, you're center-right. If it's 50-50, you're center. If it's two to three left, um, um, uh, three to two left, then you're center-left. And if it's four to one or more, you're left. So those are descriptive assertions, not about the content, but about the audience composition. And the colors, so it's important to note that CNN, the Washington Post, and and the New York Times are center-left by that regard. They get a 3 to 2 ratio from Trump retweeters, uh, uh, whereas HuffPo is, is left in this orientation. The center here, things like ABC, CBS, um, um, The Hill, uh, Reuters, AP, uh, these are uh, uh, these are green. They're smaller here. They've actually increased. Interestingly, they've increased in influence in over the, the last four years influence. since you did over the book. Over the last four years, yes. Interesting. Since we did the book, uh, when we look at the materials for 2019, 2020, they're not as big as the New York Times, the Washington Post. But but it's really interesting how the mainstream press, including the AP and CBS, etc., have increased their influence relative to the left, presumably because everybody outside of the right-wing media ecosystem is looking for the reinforcement from professional journalism that the president is lying. So so that's what you're getting there. And and there is, I want to interject just for a moment, there is a a well-thought-of journalist uh, in my home state who has started a small town, who who took over a small town newspaper and refurbished it, also started a reporting service of our state capital. And his his governing hypothesis, we had a we had a dinner where we sort of went back and forth where I was informed actually by your work. And I said, part of the challenge I see is this self-reinforcing uh, feedback loop echo chamber and his counter. And I, by the way, I think they lie alongside each other. His counter was, I, he thought that what would be ascending in demand was more fact-driven news. Uh, 
uh, was, and he, he cited back to 100 years ago, uh, after the yellow journalist, there was a, a larger demand for straight fact journalism. Those things can lie alongside each other. And what it, what it appears to be when I look at this, if I'm interpreting it correctly, is about 60% of the American media consumer is looking for something that's roughly fact-driven. Some of those will be somewhat more appealing to Huffington Post. It'll reinforce their thoughts. They're not into that dynamic at all. But still, there's a meaningful chunk, and you can tell me the percentage better than I, but somewhere north of 25% and south of 50% that is still uh, their primary news interest includes, importantly, identi identity self-reinforcement, ideological identity self-reinforcement. Yeah, so so this is a really hard question, and we don't have very clear numbers. I would say, as I try to, what we did in the book and what, I'm, what I've tried to do over the last two years, is try to integrate the data from surveys of uh, people's primary news uh, um, diet when they're looking at political news, at surveys of Republicans versus Democrats and what they read, of surveys of independents of what they rely on. So primarily from, from Pew, from Gallup, from a variety of other sources. Uh, I think th my best sense for now is that there are about 40 million on the order of half of Republican voters, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, um, who really live inside this uh, Fox, Limbaugh, Breitbart bubble. Very large. There are probably about 30% or so of people who are not so politically pre-committed, uh, who tend to just not pay that much attention to news altogether the confused middle. And then there's the remainder uh, uh, who are much more inside the, the mainstream media orientation are actually committed to political news. So, uh, so the, the, the market for fact-based news is much larger than the market for uh, identity confirming right-wing news but it is more diffuse across many more channels, so you don't get the same kind of concentrated political effect, you don't get the same kind of concentrated market with people who watch the specific shows like Hannity, like Tucker Carlson, uh, but rather you get a distribution across different media, and so they're less visible. And they include a very large number of people who at the end of the day would rather watch sports or the bachelorette and and live their lives and not be bothered by politics all the time which is a legitimate way to be a citizen <laughs> It often feels very, very attractive. Uh, a dear old friend of mine said, oh, I, I so envy the people who don't care. <laughs> and not to say they don't care, but aren't, aren't buffeted by the winds of, of what's been happening in the country over the last 40 years. I would not, I, I would not simplify it by saying a partisan back and forth. I don't, that's not how I understand political history. Uh, the, I want to get to the question, why? Why do we see this dynamic? Now, I could offer several hypotheses. One, I think you and I even discussed, I know that we did, which is that an advantage, and you even mentioned here, that Fox, an advantage Fox News had is that its, its segment that it was going after was a very, very large segment in many respects, the, the plurality dominant segment in, the Amer in American politics and media. And it was a monotheistic one. It was one that, roughly speaking, shared religion, roughly speaking, shared race, roughly speaking, shared many elements of cultural heritage. It wasn't a majority of the country at this point in the movie, but is a significant chunk. There isn't a similar, the Democratic Party, for instance, is not made up of a similar uh, monochromatic or monotheistic uh, uh, set of its coalition, right? There isn't one target audience that is as clear that made up, let's say, the Obama coalition or, you know, the view of what would be a Fox News replacement. Disabuse me of that notion or amplify it or offer other things if that's not the whole story. Uh, I think I think that's um, that's very much the heart of the story. Uh, that's very much the heart of the story. And again, uh, uh, I hate to do this, but it all really starts in the 60s and 70s. Same uh, where you where you get the major major realignment around the civil rights movement, 
the the women's movement uh, and the uh, consumer and environmental movements. What you get is a complete realignment of American politics around, on one hand, civil rights, and on the other hand, the backlash against civil rights. On one hand, the women's movement, and on the other hand, the backlash against the women's movement. On one hand, the successes of the consumer and environmental movements in the 60s, and on the other hand, the business backlash against it. And what you saw in the 70s was a consolidation that took well into the 80s to really get consolidated, but a consolidation of these three major pillars of the Republican coalition. You saw organized business increase its lobbying capacity and its coordination dramatically over the course of the 70s. Um, um, uh, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson's winner-take-all uh, politics is a must-read for anybody who cares about this. Uh, that investment was highly differential with institution building for the Republican uh, uh uh, uh, party and cherry picking of individual Democrats on the other side who were more conservative. That gave the money and the orientation toward neoliberal economic policies. But that's not enough for votes. The votes came essentially from the dual strategy of Nixon's Southern strategy and moving the Southern Democrats into the Republican Party by giving them a legitimate, uh, a, a place where they can legitimately translate the uh, uh, racial identity, the white identity anxiety into concerns about law and order and the war on drugs. It then continues with Reagan and the welfare queen anxieties about uh, uh, social insurance so that you provide a, a support for social, for, for decimation of social insurance and creating a much more insecure economic environment for the majority of uh, working families, which of course reduces bargaining power and drives stagnation, wage stagnation. So that's the white identity voters that form one part of the phalanx and overlapping with the, the Christian fundamentalist wing or base of the party, which responds in large part to the women's movement um, and obviously that coalesces around Roe v. Wade, and in a large measure also to the rights revolution more generally and the exclusion of religion from the public square, the question of school prayer, the questions of the creche in the city. As the Warren Court develops the rights revolution and stops religion, you s begin to see in the early 70s uh, self-conscious uh, exhortation by evangelical leaders to become more political. The state is coming for us in a sense. And so there becomes this foundation of the evangelical Christians responding to the women's movement and the secularization of the public sphere, the white identity voters responding to the civil rights movement and the legal uh, uh, containment of legally instantiated racism. And both of these are essentially harnessed by the business wing to provide the votes for the neoliberal transformation. That new political identity becomes the market segment on which the outrage industry at the heart of the propaganda feedback loop uh, develops. So that's why it starts with Christian Broadcasting, with Pat Robertson and the Christian Broadcasting Network and 700 Club and the domination of religious broadcasting by evangelicals in the 70s and 80s, that largely uh, crashes or partly crashes with the scandals of the late 80s of, of several of the major televangelists. Uh, but it's still even by 96, when you look at the, at the Pew polls from 96, it's still the case that roughly the same proportion of voters in 96 report that they get their primary source of news from Christian broadcasting and talk radio as those who in 2016 say that they get it from Fox News and talk radio. So Fox News in some senses steps into that role, understands the business model and the dynamics we talked about uh, move around. So that's the, that's the core dynamic. The core dynamic is an intentional creation of a new political identity that creates a new market segment in the context of a new technological and regulatory framework. 
that allows for many, many, many channels and makes this uh, hyper outrage industry producing business model so um, um, profitable that nobody else can really exist in that particular market segment. So now we have, so you said, I'm sorry to do this. Very glad that you did. And almost want to replay that last piece and would even encourage people to, those last several sentences, to uh, to rewind and replay to understand a snapshot of where we are and how we got to where we've got in American politics. Uh, so now that we are in a place with this propaganda feedback loop, now they're in a place with this new political identity that took advantage of new regulatory framework and new technology. Uh, and... And this is one of the important points that every time a healthcare story comes up, every time a Donald Trump story comes up, every time a voter suppression story comes up, and we'll get to that, uh, I have said this is also a media story. And you know, this is also a Fox News story. This is also a right wing radio story. This is also a Breitbart story because it wouldn't happen. All these people, why are the Republican Party staying with a president who does blank? Right. Things that would have seemed anathema to Republic Part, Republican Party, not only in the days of Abraham Lincoln, but even in the days of 40 years ago, uh, even in the days of 10 years ago. Why do they stay together? And, and part of it, I say, well, because Donald Trump did not create this political identity. Donald Trump did not uh, create the regulatory framework uh, or build the propaganda feedback loop. He is its apotheosis. He is its he is not Dr. Frankenstein. He is the Frankenstein's monster. Is that a useful is that a useful way to understand that? I, mean, I want to go beyond that. But first, I want to give you a chance to push back on what I just said. I think it's very useful to understand it that way. The only thing I'd say is that he also became a catalyst. So he is both a product of that system and a genuine catalyst that sped it up and, and ratcheted up to 11. Uh, uh, so he's not entirely just the product. But yes, basically it's a feedback that causes him and then he reinforces it dramatically over the last five years. And what turns on that, it seems to me, is that, yes, what we're, what we're seeing in American political media is about Fox News, and it is about Breitbart, and it is about right-wing radio and Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity, and it is about Donald Trump. But it also, at this point, isn't about Fox News. It isn't about Breitbart. It isn't about Donald Trump. It isn't about Sean Hannity and right-wing radio. It isn't merely about Rush Limbaugh that now all of those entities are not only masters but servants of that propaganda loop if they disrupt it they will be excised from it and not and no longer able to be there what is the i, I want to wait on solution i want to wait on what the heck to do about it maybe you figure that out i certainly have not uh, <laughs> but something that we didn't have a chance to talk about when when i had a chance to you know listen to your excellent remarks uh in cambridge you know a couple years back year and a half ago the uh QAnon was not yet as big a phenomenon. QAnon was not a phenomenon that I was aware of at all when the book was published. But it seems like there ought to have been multiple chapters in the book on this very experience. Is QAnon now maybe the the, the most extreme manifestation of the very uh, thing you've been analyzing? What additional thoughts do you have now that we've seen that uh, going down? QAnon is, is, is uh, th there's a level of tragedy about the people who've just gone down the rabbit hole and completely lost it that's captured there. So, so when we were looking in 2016, 2017, we already saw uh, bits and pieces of it. We already saw uh, Pizzagate, we already, which after all is, ha does have all the basic elements, the pedophilia, the satanic ritual, etc. Um, we already saw the beginnings of it. Uh, we saw that there were millions of people who were willing to buy these kinds of stories, lock, stock, and barrel. We already saw it was not, again, it's not just people from the bottom. We saw Michael Flynn tweeting about satanic rituals and pedophilia the day before the election or two days before the election, um, or essentially already seeding these. Uh, but um, there's no question. So, so here's what I actually. This is very important. Let me let me clarify. There's a huge difference between what media um, 
support or can support small, and by small I mean thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in a rabbit hole. And a different question of how you get the 30, 40 million holding people holding a position. Our work has always, at least in the last five, six years, has been focused on how you get the population level beliefs. So it's much more about how you get to three quarters or two thirds of Republicans saying that the election was stolen than it is about how you get a few tens of thousands of wacky followers um, uh, believing uh, this particular thing. That still requires narrow cost, as it were. And for that, I think social networks and YouTube uh, really do play a central role, unless and until the story comes from the mainstream. So, so even for QAnon, roll back to what we said about the pedophilia story from, face, from, from Fox News. It's still the case that the foundations of the story about satanic pedophilia running the world come from Fox News and the Clinton pedophilia story, come from Eric Prince on Breitbart XM and Michael Flynn on, on Twitter tweeting out this, this toxic combination of pedophilia, satanic ritual, etc. in the days before the 2016 election. And it comes from Alex Jones and InfoWars uh, replicating it and pushing it. All of that comes still from that same network. And then I think um, um, my, my, my uh, colleague and co-PI Ethan Zuckerman described this as, as it's almost fan fiction of the original Fox work. If you think of the, of the internet as having lots of fan fiction yeah. sites around, so the original authorship is from that core of the Fox Breitbart limbo universe. And QAnon is the fan fiction version of that same thing. And that can live on forever and go into really creative rabbit holes, in this case, creative and destructive uh, uh, at the same time. That's, that, that, that's going to be, in some sense, to try to solve that is more in common with de-radicalization of people who get into terrorist networks than it has to do with mainstream populations and how you knock some sense into large number of people who've lost their 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 orientation. So dwell on that. Another and and it's hard because I am wanting. I, I imagine as part of the as some of the segment that I am wanting to communicate to includes my own extended family, right? Who I love dearly, who we share any number of values with, uh, and who. Uh, and who I have some clear understanding of how they voted and, and want to make sure this is not only a monotheistic and, and, and monochromatic conversation. Uh, and, it is, and so when I say what I'm about to say, it makes me nervous, but it is, I was talking to a clinician. I was not talking to a, a political advocate when, who used a slightly different word than you, but drew the same conclusion. It says, understanding what you actually need is deprogramming the way that one does when somebody is trying to extract somebody from a cult. And what has to happen is deprogramming. Now, if you, what I understand is if you say somebody who is a proud member of a cult or even a co-cult leader, we need to get you out of that cult, they do not immediately say yes. <laughs> They do not immediately no, say, do. oh, I agree with what you're saying. I am glad you described what I am doing as cultish behavior. You're right that I have lost my own agency. Of course, you are so wise. Instead, what they say is, no, you're the cult. <laughs> it, it only gets them to reinforce, uh, to reconfirm their identity and withdraw even further. What lessons from deprogramming, what lessons from de-radicalization of terrorist networks can we draw, do you think? Or are you trying to draw, Professor? So, so I have to confess, this is not my specialty, and I and I I uh, I stop at diagnosis in this regard. Uh, um, I'm in some sense, um, my focus has consistently been on what to do with the larger scale populations rather than with the narrow cults. And I think in this regard, I have to say, it's November, it's past the election. We're talking after the election, and I have to say the efforts of Fox News, beginning on election day itself, and yep. certainly in the few days after, 
to call the election to, and try to save democracy. To call the election and try to save democracy. To have Cavuto shut down McCannany uh, when she's standing on the on the podium and lying. To have Chris Wallace consistently. One of the things that came out in the mail-in voter fraud study that we did this year, very clearly, Chris Wallace repeatedly comes back and says, there is no evidence of voter fraud. So one of the things we'll have to find out, we won't do it, but people who do the the uh, um, uh, surveys with large-scale surveys, that's not what we do, but when other people who do the surveys will have to try to figure out what impact that had on Fox News viewers. And, and it will be tragic if it turns out that the market dynamic I identify um, uh, in the in the book uh, makes it so that instead of uh, Wallace or Cavuto or or the Fox News news desk succeeding in bringing along large numbers of their viewers, they actually end up just losing viewership and and providing the foundation for Trump TV. Uh, that's that's going to be a real tragedy, and and clearly they're trying to swim against the current. Unfortunately, the structural determinants of the propaganda feedback loop suggest that that makes them vulnerable to a Trump TV move after January 20th. But that we're going to have to look at the at the surveys. What you do with the narrower cultish groups like QAnon? Um, they they're pretty lost for a while. I don't know that we have a decent mechanism to do it. And you're already seeing people jumping off uh, 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 off Twitter to find their own networks uh, once they get shut down. So I don't see the social networks being able to do much of anything. Maybe Fox News will help with some, um, but we have a really large one of the tragic observations from this last election is we have a really large segment in the population that is uh, quite disconnected from um, facts. Yeah, and I, I'm going to repeat the question of, so what do we do? What does democracy do? And then I want to talk about voter suppression specifically in your recent article. Uh, but it does seem to me to some degree there's a collective action problem that I have to imagine there are a few that, that not only Fox, but there's got to be uh, there's got to be other players in that space that say elections still matter. Facts still matter. Democracy still matters at some level. And who now that and now that uh, now that Donald Trump has been defeated, that there is that there can be some breaking of the fever. Right. There's got to. But if only one of them departs, if only one defects and everybody else maintains cooperation with the network propaganda feedback loop then this one gets voted off the island and everybody else stays there. So it seems like a few of them need to sort of hold hands and say, okay, there's still some basic principles that we hold to. As you think about the best moves, whether they are regulatory moves, activist moves, voter moves, media moves, sort of, because there hasn't been the technologically where, technological wherewithal to do this kind of thing in other parts of history, except for maybe I don't know. I guess I guess Soviet Union uh, controlled media, right? Totalitarian regime controlled German controlled media. I guess has some as some of the same dynamics, but this is a different thing because it's not just coming from the state. It's a net, the network propaganda feels like a new phenomenon. But as you start thinking about pro democracy responses from whatever sector. What do you think are the smartest pro-democracy responses to the situation that you have analyzed and understand that we live in now? Uh, the most important source of disinformation in American politics today is the Republican Party leadership. So that needs to change. At the end of the day, George W. Bush can come out and say, congratulations, Joe Biden, but Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and Ted Cruz and the the RNC are all consistently and continuously continuing to stoke the flames and throw more uh, uh, more fuel on the fire. It's it's um, it's when when your active leaders have a common front and tell you that the Democrats have stolen the election, tell you like Lindsey Graham on the outlet that you most trust on Hannity, tells you that Philadelphia is like an oily snake, 
you don't trust them. And anyway, those cities are black. You don't trust those people anyway. So why would you trust your election to any of that? So, so it's at the moment, I'm le it's less of a collective action problem as though you have a whole broad range of well-intentioned actors who have the mm. trust and attention of conservative voters who each of whom would love to intervene to save democracy, but they can't get together because they need to hold hands. At the moment, that's not what you have. You have George W. Bush trying to do it. You have a handful of Republican senators uh, trying to do it. But the Republican leadership is standing shoulder to shoulder. Mike Pompeo is standing and saying, get ready for a second Trump transition. Bill Barr is saying to prosecutors, go find voter fraud. You have a partisan shoulder to shoulder wall insisting to the voters of the Republican Party that the election was stolen. This is not a collective action problem. The problem is they're so good at having collective action around the line. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, is now saying that we're all being brainwashed into accepting that uh, Joe Biden won the election. Uh, what I heard you say, I think, is that people who engage in that kind of counterfactual propagandization, that sort of reinforcement of the feedback loop, need to lose. Right, that, that Republican leadership needs to lose. Now, if that's the conclusion, what's in it for Republicans? Why should a, why should a person who uh, does not prioritize women's right to choose and does prioritize the uh, sanctity of a pre-born human life, why should somebody who doesn't think that it is worth the toil and trouble to uh, sa save the world from climate change uh, either because it's just too much toil and trouble or because God is going to come and uh, and bring to heaven the righteous before that's ever a big problem. Uh, why should someone maybe even inland from there who believes that ultimately the way an economy works better is to ward the powerful and have things uh, emanate from there to have uh, not prioritizing small d democratic freedom but prioritizing capital freedom why should somebody who prioritizes the ability to own uh, some set of you know large scale firearms who prioritizes that as a most as a critical element of their freedom What's in it for them? Why should they care about the small-D Democratic experiment? Why should they care about net network propaganda except for to reinforce it? Is there anything in it for somebody other than a New York Times reading pointy-headed Harvard person? Uh, well, um, in some sense, I'd say uh, our, 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 the lowest common denominator of the argument for democracy is the Churchillian argument of, of this is the worst uh, uh, possible system except for all the others that have been tried. If you can show me a system in the world in which some perfectionist ideology, and as you say, it doesn't matter, the perfectionism might be saving uh, uh, all lives of, of the unborn, it might be a pure market, uh, 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 I don't care. If perfectionism anywhere enforced through authoritarian one-party rule is a place you can point to as a stable success that you would rather live in than where you live in today, let's have a conversation. If you want to say, okay, let me show you the Chinese government structure since uh, uh, then. Okay, let's have an argument. Is that where you want to be? What are the examples? What are the disadvantages? Um, at the end of the day, the advantage for Republicans in staying within the norms of democracy are the same as the advantage for Democrats. It's the fact that as among all of the systems that we've tried, this one has the best ability to correct errors. This one has the best abilities to avoid the system spinning into a, a repressive authoritarianism. Uh, and it will spin out of control unless the major parties, there can always be, democracy is robust enough to maintain uh, 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 margins that are revolutionary and, and, and authoritarian,
uh, uh, but um, as long as the major parties are largely uh, uh, in agreement on continuing the the uh, the the institutional structure of orderly elections and orderly transfer of power to avoid the ossification and authoritarian of one party rule. If they basically end up believing that they believe in a particular perfectionist program of complete deregulation, a powerful oligarchy, um, uh, racial hierarchy, and and um, uh, uh, regulation of of reproduction, they better make sure they always win, because if you're in a system that can tip in the other direction, then you always lose. That's 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 the least that's the most procedural argument, and I think the least common denominator uh, that I suspect most Republicans in a context where they don't feel threatened in their identity yeah. will agree with. Yeah. That rebuilding, and this is, this is where you're singing from our sheet of music, uh, that rebuilding a, an a priori, a first principle commitment to democracy, to, to a democratic republic, that piece, and trying to figure out how to have that conversation not only in, an, in a context that is from a political party preference, not only in a context that is disrupting uh, the the identity of someone else, not making that conversation just about Trump, uh, and at the same time somehow figuring out still how to have an honest conversation, given your data. That is where, I mean, that's why this court sits, right? I mean, that's why we, that's why we have these conversations, but we so appreciate your time. I want to do a hard pivot before you have to run away uh, to your more recent article about why current the current Republican Party has to engage or why they really do engage in voter suppression. And I can just, of course, the conversation we've already had leads up to that pretty well. But why don't I just ask that question? Why is voter suppression such a critical strategic priority for the Republican Party in this century? They, 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 that's, um, that flows straight out of the structure of the coalition. Uh, the 2012 post-mortem of the election, uh, the RNC report basically said, look, we can't expand our base if we keep treating everyone who is not white and religious as the only base. Uh, in particular, they said, don't look at immigration, stop telling Latino voters they can't be with us, we have to grow. This country the, the proportion of naturalized citizens in the electorate uh, has increased dramatically in the last 20 years. Uh, young people, young voters are consistently less racist and less um, uh, particular uh, and less heterosexist than their older um, um, uh, relatives. Uh, the proportion of people who identifies strongly as Christian is gradually shrinking. Uh, the long-term trajectory demands that the Republican Party do one of two things, either recede from some of its very heavy emphasis on white religious identity and open up to new constituencies as uh, 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 the demographic makeup and uh, cultural uh, uh, political positions of younger people change, or that they prevent these new constituencies from voting. Those are the two options. And because they're stuck in the propaganda feedback loop, because it's so hard to chart a political path within the Republican Party that bucks these core identitarian politics that have made up the Republican Party for the last 40 years, they're stuck with the only other alternative, which is to try to prevent minority voters, to try to prevent um, uh, naturalized voters, uh, to try to contain and make harder uh, uh, the vote. And that's, the, that's why the attack on the legitimacy of elections in Philadelphia and Detroit and Atlanta is so profoundly dangerous. That's why Greg Abbott, 
continuously trying to prevent voting and giving Harris County with its millions of people the same access to drop boxes as a rural county with almost no people. That's why these are so dangerous, because if you're not willing to adapt your political program and your ideology to fit a changing society, if you're consistently insisting on being a minority identity party, all you have left is to suppress the vote of the new voters. And that's what we are seeing so aggressively happen in this election, first as disinformation and efforts to block the vote, and now after the election as efforts to delegitimate and overturn the vote. That's a real threat to democracy. And this got to one of the questions we prepared before we started talking to you. Is American democracy in crisis? Is that a is that an overstatement? Is that an alarmist, uh, chicken little, uh, crying wolf argument? I don't think it's a chicken little argument uh, when, as a practical matter, in the middle of a pandemic, the GSA won't recognize the transition and the outgoing administration won't cooperate to allow the incoming administration that everybody knows is the incoming administration to prepare itself. That cre starts to create gaps. When you have the entire Republican sitting leadership, I'm not talking about uh, 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 people in the position of elder statements like, like George W. Bush or, or Jim Baker. Uh, I'm talking about the active, the McConnell, the McCarthy, the, the, the people who are actively uh, governing or, or, or have positions of power. And currently when accountable that, to Republican primary voters. Exactly. When those people are not willing to uh, 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 cooperate in the orderly transition of government, that's a crisis. Now, it doesn't mean that the crisis will go on forever. It doesn't mean that Biden won't take over the White House, that things won't potentially get better. I think, though, that if the Republican Senate remains uh, in under, under Republican control, we're likely to see what we saw uh, when Mitch McConnell was last uh, Senate Majority Leader under a Democratic president, substantial obstructionism, difficulties in functioning, and you're going to continue to see a dysfunctional uh, uh, democracy with, if it is functional, an ever increasingly imperial presidency with a presidency in the White House rather than the uh, confirmed appointed departments play having the most power. So you're getting already significant shift from the legislative to the executive arm because of the dysfunction of this interaction. And you're, uh, uh, and you're getting, at this point, large, large segments of the population who simply don't accept the election of the outcome. That, to me, is a crisis of democracy. It doesn't mean we can't come out of it, but I think we certainly are in genuine crisis. There is in, uh, already begun a 2020 postmortem when political parties and strategists and analysts and members of the media uh, and academics get together and say, well, what happened? What do we learn from that? And for people whose objective is to win elections, they say, well, what do we have to do differently in the future? After the 2012 election, there are postmortems within the Republican Party apparatus that, well, we should change things. The postmortem analysis is not the primary advice that was used, that advice would have uh, would have elected probably Marco Rubio as the Republican standard bear. Right. It's like, well, grow our Latino vote share a little bit. Right. Try to make sure we don't lose suburban women and then we can hold power. Donald Trump doubled down. He said, no, primary only Republican base only uh, propaganda feedback loop only or primarily maybe reaching out a little bit to uh, to more uh, to identity based voters who don't only identify with as Republican voters, but identify as as white voters and white male voters. Uh, do you think that it's just going to be more cowbell? Do you think there's going to be in this postmortem a different set of lessons that starts impacting how the Republican Party analyzes its best strategy going into 2024? Uh, as you said earlier, basically the only reason to only way to change this dynamic is for Republicans to lose. If they lose, then they will change. They lost the presidency, but what polls showed is an 8 percent down uh, president who never had 50 percent plus approval, who 
was president when hundred, literally hundreds of thousands of Americans died, many of which were preventable, that saw an economic cataclysm happen during that time, was still able to be, get 70 million votes, get within 3 million votes of getting reelected, probably hold the U.S. Senate, and hold state legislative chambers all around the country. They lost, but only kind of. And now, what lessons should be they draw, or what lessons might you hope they draw? Uh, they're not going to draw any lessons from this. This was um, this was as near a victory as could possibly be under almost impossible conditions for an incumbent to get reelected. Uh, it's really shocking to have such a dramatic uh, pre-election failure on the pandemic and the economy and for an incumbent to be reelected. The fact that, that it was so close and again, so close, we have to put things in perspective. At the moment, it looks like he's at least 5 million votes behind, if not more. The closeness comes from the anti-democratic structure of the Electoral College. Otherwise, it wasn't a close election at all. But I would say if anyone <laughs> if anyone needs a post-mortem, it's the Democratic Party for how close the election was and yeah. how unpersuasive the, 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 the Senate results were under these extreme conditions and so it's too soon it's going to be six months at least before we actually get the voter uh, uh the, the more authoritative voter uh profiles the interviews the surveys all of that stuff will take months between now and then there's going to be a lot of punditry and relatively little hard evidence i think clear from in these initial moments for Democrats is that the idea of the so-called Latino voter as, or, or Latinx voter as a single monolith is just a mistake. And trying to understand what the story is, uh, um, why different voters from different countries of origin voted in different ways than the supposed exception, that's going to be uh, important. I think it's going to be important to look at how uh, Democrats did succeed in some states. I wouldn't, I wouldn't understate the the extent to which voters willing to stand for five and ten hours to overcome voter suppression is a unique question. And so the question becomes: How do you? What are the specific fighting points po uh, points to allow people to vote? Stacey Abrams did a remarkable ground shifting work uh, in terms of, of voter access and voter um, um, uh, ability to vote. How is that implemented across the board? How do you prevent this kind of, of, of suppression? So, so there are a lot of strategic decisions to make and we're already seeing the battle in the Democratic Party between the progressives who say the people who really turned out were the people who were progressive versus the, the, the moderates saying we would have done better if you wouldn't have uh, tied us to Medicare for all and, 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 and other uh, uh, or defund the police. So you're already seeing that happen in the Democratic Party. In the Republican Party, I think you cannot look at Lindsey Graham on Hannity, on, at Newt Gingrich on Hannity. You cannot look at Mitch McConnell and not expect that what we're seeing is that the Republican Party, at least through 2024, is going to try to triple down on the Trump strategy of um, um, mobilizing the base through stoking the fear and anger and outrage and anxiety, the negative partisanship, and trying to get to win through that rather than anything remotely like trying to imagine what it would have been like if Jeb Bush had been uh, the candidate in 2016. I, I, I think they're going to need to lose much more clearly yeah. and for more than one election before such a deep reassessment happens. And to me, that was what it was at stake in this election. It was not only the presidency of the current, you know, the current outgoing president was not only repudiation of, you know, some style of being president, but it was, will there be a disruption in the propaganda feedback loop? And I think that 
yeah, this wasn't clo- this wasn't a, an election that was close like 1960 or close like 2000. But there is a it, it can be baffling to some that it was not the kind of margin of 1964 or 1984, and and that's and that's where we stand. And and it's related to why I'm so glad that we had this time together and at this timing, because it if we if we tie this together what we were talking about before, and why the Stacey Abrams move why. Focusing on voter suppression, if you can align your tactics and your strategy along with your uh, fundamental argument that is also aligned with your uh, fundamental moral underpinning, if you can say, we want to expand democracy. How come? Because democracy is important. How come? Because democracy is what we're going to need to do to save ultimately humanity and make sure we can live better together. That That's why you've got to vote. That's why we have rules that get you to make it easier for you to vote. And that's why we got to make sure we have a, a, a movement around democracy. I do think to me that's the big move. And again, that's why we do. That's why we have these conversations. Anything I should have asked you that I didn't? I think we've 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 uh, uh, tested the the anyone any listeners. Uh, but they're just getting ready. Well enough. Okay. After the break, we're going to get into hour two. I'm kidding. The uh, uh, I want to say thank you so much, to Professor Yohai Bankler. The book is Network Propaganda. Again, I think it is a must read or at least must understand if you want to understand American politics and American media in this century. Understand what we need to do going forward to make sure that this crisis in democracy is not one that persists over time. Professor, thank you so much for spending the time. My pleasure. Happy to be here. You're welcome.